The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. I mentioned at the end of my little tree there that there are other ways of doing evaluation that don't necessarily require having a, um, a prototype. And oftentimes you do have a prototype and you do your experiment, you do your study of some sort, and you add something after that. And that is often something like a questionnaire or a personal interview. It's a huge chance if you have a person who is willing to dedicate their time to try out your system and give you feedback on it. That's quite a commitment. Usually people get a little bit of, you know, a couple of euros for it, money or some sweets or something to compensate them for their time. Uh, and while they're there, use the time to ask them, now that the experiment is over, that you, they, there's no longer a danger of biasing results or anything, you can ask all the questions that you wanted to ask them. They can ask you all the questions they might have. <coughs> These users have worked with your design for a fairly long time, so ask them what you know, they're a valuable resource to, to go into. Um, you can do questionnaires via the web online, and it's very popular to do that, but also return rates are horrible, and also you never know how people actually interpret the, res the questions you are asking. So if you're planning a study for your thesis and you want to do a questionnaire as part of that, rather ask, I would say, 20 people in person then say, and, and be with them when they fill in the questionnaire so that you can actually understand what their answers mean and they can ask clarifying questions about them rather than having 100 people filling in your web survey but you know, without any kind of interaction possible during it. Another way to find um, out how um, evaluate, uh, or to evaluate how your system is working is after your project is over. For example, when people when you write software and people leave reviews in the App Store or they send email bug they email you bug reports, that's a great source of feedback that you can evaluate. How many are coming in? What kind of features are people having trouble with? Are they having more trouble with one versus the other? Hotlines where you, where support calls come in, um, or retrospective interviews and questionnaires that you do after the fact, like we just mentioned above, or even field observations. So. You wrote some kind of system, you go out there and you observe real people using your system you know, in the actual environment. Um, very informative. So um, it's surprising, by the way, to see how, many, how, how few companies actually go out and actually talk to their users after they've um, sent out some software. Um, that's, a, that's an often overlooked resource. So in all, we've now covered all these evaluation techniques here. Um, and what's left to talk about is um, a little bit more about how to deal with those users that help you with your tests. Um, tests are something that are not very comfortable for the participant because, well, imagine you're invited to, to do a user test and uh, you're told that uh, you know, this, we're going to measure typing speed on two different keyboards. You will still feel like you want to perform well, right? So you're going to be under some kind of pressure to do a good job. Um, you start thinking competitively. Um, you might be embarrassed about typing mistakes that you make. Um, a lot of people think that they are being tested and not the system. And that is probably one of the biggest misunderstandings that you have to get clear of when you're running user tests. Make it clear that you're not testing them you're testing the system, and they are helping you test the system. Um, I like to think of these users who help us and participate in a, in a test as they're like test drivers for a car or test pilots, right? I want them to kick the tires. I want them to find out what's still wrong with our construction, with our prototype, and I want them to tell us what's going on, or what we need to fix. So make sure that they feel uh, that they're treated with respect and that they feel respected all the time and that they're treated not as somebody who's being evaluated, but somebody who's helping you evaluate a system. So how do we do that? A couple examples, just to give you a sense of how, you're gonna, how you should be dealing with, um, with these users who are helping you in your test. Don't waste their time, which means run a pilot test before with a good friend and iron out all the problems you have. Maybe you discover that 
when people come in and say, okay, I want to start a test, you start your program, and it takes like two minutes to set it up. And then the person sitting there twiddling their thumbs waiting for you to get done. That's not good, right? So this should be something you notice in a pilot test, or maybe your software crashes, your, pilot, your, your, your study software t crashes. So fix these things. Have everything ready when the users arrive for the test. Make sure they feel comfortable. Stress that the system is being tested, not them. I just explained that. Also confirm that the system might still have bugs or areas that are difficult to use because you are trying to fix these things, right? So when they run into problems, that's actually not a problem, right? That's fine. You want to see those things. You want to see the issues that you can resolve. Also let people know that if they do feel uncomfortable using the system at any time, they can just stop, and that's also OK, right? Guarantee privacy. So you're coming into a company. You're asked to you know, install a better, I don't know, um, forms management system. A couple you know, office workers, secretaries sit down with you and um, are going to use the old and the new system side by side. And meanwhile, the boss is standing behind them and watching them work. Right? That's going to make them feel very uncomfortable. Right? So make sure that privacy is being guaranteed, that any test results that are being done during the test, obviously nobody's watching, that should be clear. But even if you have collected results, for example, the speed with which forms are being filled in with the, with the existing old system are being collected anonymously and are not being shared with the employer. Let the user know what you are recording, if you are recording. And you are probably a recording, like we explained before. Right? So you're capturing screenshots or a screen video. You're capturing maybe an over-the-shoulder view of a user using a mobile device. We've done that with a smartphone test. We've had people record it over the shoulder so we can see the screen and the hand of the user working on it. Um, answer any other questions um, before the test, but don't bias people. Right? Don't influence them in one way or the other. Um, and only use people who are volunteering to do this, and not people who are in some kind of um, dependent situation that need to be uh, in the test. Um, we typically do this with a consent form. So you'll have a written form that explains how the data that you're collecting will be used, that confirms that you're going to be using the data in this way and this other way. You sign it, the test participant signs it, and agrees to this kind of data sharing before you start so you both have a clear picture of what's going uh, to be going on. Um, this is often tricky because you want to use the data in some kind of way for publication, right? So you might, ha you might be collecting data on, uh, I don't know, um, typing speeds, and you want to report that in a, in a table in your, in your paper. But, and that's fine as long as it's anonymized and, and no single individual can be, can be found. On the other hand, if you say, uh, we collected this, this data at, I don't know, the local uh, Siemens um, office, and here's the data split into typing speed between male uh, participants and female participants, and there was only one female participant in the group, and you're reporting those, this data, then all of a sudden you can re-identify that person through you know, looking hard at the data, and that is not, uh, of, uh, not, not OK, of course. Um, this leads into the whole question of ethical rules, of course, right? So um, we don't run into this issue often. People in psychology departments have this more frequently. Of course, you have to be careful that you don't run anything that could be harmful in any way to, to people, right? Um, but that should be clear. During the test, don't waste people's time. Don't let them complete unnecessary tasks. So for example, if what you're testing is the print function of a text editor, don't make them write a three-page letter first and then test the print function, right? Give them a letter that's written and ask them just to print it. Um, and again, guarantee privacy. So don't let the user's boss or, or colleagues or anybody else watch while the test is being conducted. Make sure people are comfortable. So uh, it makes sense to have a task designed so that early on in the task, they can be successful, right? So don't make them fail right away with something really hard, but make them succeed first in a, in a task. Um, also deliver the tasks uh, one by one. So when people come in for the test, don't go like slump down like a 60-page stack of papers. These are all the tasks you're going to be doing, but give them the task one by one so they always know what they're supposed to be doing next. 
uh, create a relaxed atmosphere, make sure breaks are in there, coffee is there, and so on. Um, also, if they're using that new system of yours and, and they make mistakes, don't go like, oh no, press that button. Oh no, that's wrong. You know, be sure that you don't communicate unsatisfaction with the users because, hey, they are helping you understand problems your software has, right? So that's what they're doing for you. Also, try to avoid interruptions like cell phone calls, turn off your cell phone, maybe ask them to turn off theirs if that's okay. Um, and if you feel that things are becoming too uncomfortable in the test, just abort. Say like, okay, that's fine. Um, we've collected enough data. Thank you for your help and uh, you know, move on to some other task or, or maybe uh, stop the test altogether. After the task, you still test, you still want to make sure people are comfortable. So again, stress that they helped finding bugs um, and improved the system. Now you can answer all those questions that you couldn't have answered earlier without changing the experiment. Um, still guarantee privacy, so don't publish results that could be associated with specific individuals. I talked about that. And recordings that you show outside your own group have to be, uh, have to have written consent from users, right? This is important. Uh, we once went to a museum in the US um, where we had installed an exhibit, and we wanted to record some video of people using it. And the, uh, the museum pointed out, uh, this was a children's museum, the museum pointed out that that's definitely needs prior written consent from people because the, he, he said like the worst example you could think of is um, a woman with her child being in a um, witness protection program, you know, having been relocated to a different part of the states um, after sort of, you know, an abusive father uh, has been separated from her. And now, you know, our video ends up online and gets shared because it's a great research video or whatever. And suddenly, you know, she's on that videotape um, in the museum, um, clearly recognizable. So those things you clearly want to avoid. And a lot of people have concerns about their kids being in any kind of um, video material online. So always something to make sure you get consent from the parents or, or the person themselves. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.